And welcome to Hitting Home with Mike and RF on Rogers TV. Barry, and this week uh, in the COVID Stay Home edition, we're thrilled to have a guest with us. to what's going on in Canada, and that is our federal member of parliament for Barrie and Innisfil, John Broussard. John, thanks for taking the time uh, to join us on the show today. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Mike. Good to see you guys. Good to see Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And, and, and John, let's just jump right into it. You're, you're back in Ottawa this week. Uh, you're not somebody who's taking uh, too much of a break. I know you are a very hardworking person with a busy schedule. Give us a sense of what the latest is in the last couple of days uh, in Ottawa in, in the discussion on, on how we're balancing life at home, health, and the health of the economy at the same time. Well, there uh, really hasn't been much of uh, time off since March 13th, actually. Uh, my office, both in Barrie Innisfil and here in Ottawa, and I'm in Ottawa because the House is sitting tomorrow, uh, have been working uh, literally around the clock trying to guide individuals and businesses through the COVID-19 crisis, particularly the benefits that are available to individuals and businesses in the riding. Uh, we're also, you know, I guess the best way to describe it, one of my staff uh, described it like this, we're almost like 911 operators, uh, you know, trying to work out, figure out what the emergency is and then guiding people to where they need to go. But uh, there really hasn't been any time off since this crisis really started taking hold here in Canada. And that was around March 13th. And I know I've been going at it every day and I've been coming back and forth to Ottawa to sit in on those in-house sessions like the one that's happening tomorrow. So, Mike... I want to I want to hand this over to you, Mike. But I mean, I, I, John, our show traditionally is about real estate, the real estate market, and finance. And Mike, why don't you lead us off in terms of stats that you're seeing, and uh, uh, you know, bounce some ideas off of John there and get his perspective. Well, yeah, I'll start in a more general way, and that would mm. mean that I mean the social and economic impacts of COVID nineteen. We probably haven't seen anything like this uh, since going back to World War II and the Great Depression. And the cost of recovery is going to be steep. I mean, we're probably seeing our deficit go from go up tenfold uh, in the last few months as a result and just trying to meet the needs and demands uh, and, and keep this from getting too far out of control. But eventually, this does have to be paid back. And typically, that comes from uh, cuts to spending and from our taxes. So. The question I would have for you, John, is do you think us as Canadians uh, and as Canadian business owners, uh, should we be concerned? Should we be scared of what lies ahead in that regard? Well, I think there's there's definitely a lot of anxiety, uh, Mike and Arif, that exists out there. And listen, I mean, we were saying even before this crisis hit, the level of deficit spending that was occurring with this government. Um, you know, if you watched our finance critic, Pierre Paglia, throughout the, the process, he would al he always talk about two things happening, right? Taxes go up. Uh, or uh, or spending gets cut. And so that's a natural evolution of overspending. And I would equate it to similar to your own household, Mike. I mean, you can't overspend or else something's got to give. And so when you look at the level of spending that's uh, that's gone on, and listen, there have been a tremendous amount of individuals and businesses who've been hurt as a result of the economy been sh uh, being shut down. And there's no question that there was obvious government intervention that was required. Uh, but to put it in context, just the, the level of spending that's gone on, $252 billion in direct and deferred uh, tax uh, spending has, has happened so far. You know, the federal budget on an annual basis is about $320 billion. So in just the one month, we spent nearly the amount that the government would spend on a yearly basis for those types of programs. So there is a general uh, significantly uh, significant concern that exists among uh, Canadians right now about that level of spending. But that level of spending, you know, was obviously happening pre-COVID. It's just been on a magnitude that none of us have ever seen in our lifetimes and many lifetimes for that matter. Right. So I think to put things in perspective, though, John, this is not this is not a partisan discussion. I I, I would uh, tip my hat to every a lot of cooperation going on uh, to address the issue. But I think that the point that you raise is very valid, and that is, and it's something we talked about offline a little bit. Typically speaking, when the economy is good, when the economy is strong, let 
let the economy do what it's doing, let the private sector, let the business sector do what it's doing and allow uh, it, it to keep the economic engine running. And then when we trend towards a recession, which is what we're doing now, that is the time that we should be topping in, uh, tapping into the reserves and the coffers to help grow and, and stimulate the economy. If we've been doing that for the last six years plus, uh, you know, what's left over? At the end of the day, there is only one wallet. The government doesn't have any money. It's the Canadians, it's the taxpayer that, that's going to pay the price. And, and so I think what you're telling me is we're seeing that crisis right now. We don't have anything left over in the bank. Well, we're, we're not seeing it now because we're in the middle of the crisis. Um, you know, as I said earlier, when governments uh, intervened, uh, and they did at all levels, uh, provincial, uh, federal and municipal, it was intended to help people get through this crisis, Arif, and rightly so, because, you know, you can't just shut down the economy and put uh, seven to eight million people out of work and the businesses who employ them out of gaining the type of revenue that they were gaining pre-crisis, uh, you, you can't just expect that, you know, it's not going to have an impact. So government had to intervene, and they did. Uh, the challenge right now, because we're at the peak of the crisis, um, you know, that, that economic wave is going to come crashing in at some point. And all of this spending that's gone on and, uh, you know, the support for individuals and businesses will have to be brought under control. And so the question is, how then do we bring this under control? Do we further stimulate uh, the economy through government spending? Do we support businesses through reductions of regulation, taxation, le legislation? Because I really truly believe that it's going to be the power of the Canadian economy and its people that are going to propel us out of this crisis economically. Uh, but I think, you know, when you look at GDP growth, for example, in the second quarter, it's expected to retract by about 30 percent. Think about that, uh, you know, the impact on that. And what what is the demand side of the equation? I mean, we are, you know, a commodity-based economy. We are a consumer-based economy. If there's no demand on either side of that, we've certainly seen an impact on the commodities, uh, the oil sector, for example, uh, Alberta and Newfoundland, then it's going to be that much more difficult for us to really rebound and get out of this. So I, I, think, I think the way that government does this is to get out of everybody's way and let the power of, of our economy, our businesses, and our people really do what we need to do to, uh, to power us out of this and, and start at least on the track of economic recovery. I think that that's a great point. We're going to segue right into a, a quick break, and then we come back. Mike, I'm going to give you the floor, and we'll talk about how do we stimulate this economy going. we got to go to break real quick, though. Uh, MP John Broussard, Barry Innisfil, thank you so much for being here from Ottawa, taking the time. We'll be right back with uh, Hitting Home with Mike and Arf right after this break. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. There's a tremendous artistic community in Simcoe County and that uh, impacts a great deal on my paintings. Part of being an artist is looking a little bit differently and thinking, you know, I could crop that out, I could change that a little bit, and that would be a good painting. The land and the trees and all of that lends inspiration and to my my process but uh, then I also have traditional paintings uh, portraits and things like that
welcome back to Hitting Home with Mike and Eric. And we have as our guest today, uh, Barry Innisville MP, John Broussard, who's with us from Ottawa, from uh, Parliament Hill. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about, John, and one of the things we're lucky or fortunate uh, for right now is that interest rates are and have been low for some time. And I think Canadian homeowners and would-be homeowners are dependent upon those rates staying low, uh, especially in light of everything that's been going on and the fr frailty right now with our economy. Uh, do you foresee that interest rates uh, will stay low for the foreseeable future, or can you speak to that? Well, I, I can, Mike, and I think, you know, to look at that, to understand just how fragile Canadian households are leading into this, uh, Canada was uh, al already the largest indebted household nation of the G20. Uh, for every dollar seventy-two that uh, was coming into the household, uh, or sorry, for every dollar that was coming into the household, dollar seventy-two was going out towards debt. So we've lived through a generation of uh, relatively low mortgage rates uh, comparative to the 80s, for example, when I bought my first home at 14.75%, uh, uh, I think was the mortgage rate. And it, it was a semi-detached home in Orangeville. And we, we didn't understand, Leanne and I, how we were even going to survive that, but we did. Yeah. Uh, but we've lived through that generation of low interest rates. And in fact, throughout this crisis, we've seen the ba Bank of Canada intervene and lower interest rates uh, currently, I think they're at 0.5% uh, uh, right now. And so, uh, you know, that, that's in spite of the uh, $300 billion of li liquidity that's been given to the bank to deal and make sure that our banking system uh, stays robust. Uh, but I, I, I don't think you need to ask me, Mike. I think if you look at the evidence provided by the uh, governor of the Bank of Canada, Stephen Polos, who last week spoke at Finance Committee and said it's not uh, a matter of, uh, uh, of if, it's, it's, it will happen. There's no question yeah. that interest rates are going to go up. And then, of course, the parliamentary budget officer, who last week was before the Finance Committee, gave incredible testimony about the state of the country's finances as it stands with this crisis. And even Yves Giroux, the PBO, uh, independent PBO of Parliament said that interest rates are going to go up. And as I said earlier, the challenge right now for most households will be on the issue of the deferrals, the mortgage deferrals, the property tax deferrals and others. Uh, they're going to they're going to start catching up to people in August or September. And I think people need to be prepared for that, Mike. Yeah. So I want to talk about that just for a quick second, because, I mean, that is something that I think, especially when it was rolled out, was not very well understood, and it certainly wasn't very well explained. And and the rule of law typically is, it doesn't matter how well the legislators or those who craft the language of a contract understand what they're writing, it's how well is it received by the average Canadian, and, and do they understand what they're about to embark on by, by clicking an easy, it's, you know, it's almost like it's marketing, just one click and you can defer your mortgage payment, uh, it's as easy as one, two, three, that's dangerous, right? And I don't think that the average Canadian understood, at least not at the time, and it's perhaps uh, possible that some still don't understand what that impact is. It's not a grant. It was not a forgivable loan. And at some point, the bank's going to come knocking and come collecting that outstanding. If times were tight and if you haven't had chance, a chance to, to sort of uh, rebuild your coffers at home, there are people who are going to struggle to, to stay in their homes. Yeah, and I think the numbers speak for themselves, Eric. If you look, I, uh, the latest number I saw was almost 8 million people had applied for the emergency response benefit, for example. That's 8 million people that haven't had any of their traditional income in the last couple of months and have relied on government assistance in order to get them through this crisis. Now, there's a lot of assumptions to be made, and that is whether people are going to be able to go back to work in a, in a shorter period of time, whether this will be prolonged, what happens if there's another wave and, you know, we start shutting down different sectors. Um, so there's, there's, again, to your point earlier, Mike, about, you know, the concern, I think, you know, I certainly have significant concern as I talk to people in my riding about the situation that they're in and how they're going to be able to deal with it. And I think the level of anxiety uh, that exists is, is palpable. And uh, we're, we've got to make sure that, A, we reopen the economy, we do it safely, 
uh, but we put people in a position where they get back to work and make sure that employers are, are, are putting their people back to work and, and getting the economy open again. That's critical for the sake of, of our country going forward. Mike, I got a question, though. Mike, unless you do, go right ahead, Mike. I just wanted to ask, uh, unless you had a follow-up to that, because I'm going to take us in a, a little bit of a different direction. No, it's a follow-up. It's a follow-up, and it really is this, um, Mike and, and John. Uh, here's the thing. What we're doing on this show right now, though, is we're all talking about acknowledging what we believe is the problem. We're acknowledging uh, a, a fear and a concern that we have. Who at Parliament Hill and in, in Queen's Park, for that matter, is talking about a genuine solution? And that's something that I haven't heard enough of. And what are your thoughts on that? And I don't care which party you're coming from. Yeah, I, I, and I agree, Eric. You know, one of the things throughout this crisis is we've really tried to not look at this on a partisan level. This is a Canadian crisis, and it requires all Canadians, including political parties, regardless of whether you're in government or opposition, to be working together. And so, you know, during the course of this crisis, we've been providing solutions based on what we're hearing on the ground to the government, and we've seen a reflection of that in uh, announcements. There was one today about the emergency wage subsidy for businesses about lowering the, the criteria because much of what's been announced so far has been very prescriptive and, and we've been hearing about that and advocates like the Canadian Chamber, the Ontario Real Estate Association, Canadian, etc. have all been advocating for these type of changes. But going forward, uh, and I think I touched on this earlier, it will be the power of the Canadian economy. It means government getting out of the way from a tax, a legislative and a regulatory basis and allowing Canadians to do what they do, and that is to make sure that we put them in a position to compete. Compete not just interprovincially, because that's a whole other area that needs to be uh, resolved, the interprovincial trade and unlocking, you know, multis, billions of dollars uh, of interprovincial trade among uh, provinces in this country. Uh, that's, that's where I would start, quite frankly. In fact, two weeks ago, I questioned uh, the Deputy Prime Minister about where we are on that. And you think about unlocking those billions of dollars of interprovincial trade, considering the restrictions that are going on right now. But the other thing, uh, you know, more so is to make sure that we allow those traditional sectors to get us out of this. And those traditional sectors include the natural resource sector. Uh, the fact that, uh, you know, we're able to produce uh, oil, clean Canadian energy and export that around the world, whether it's nat natural gas or oil, making sure that we get our products to market through refineries in eastern Canada. The construction industry is going to be critical as well in making sure that we recover the automobile sector as well. And yes, green energy does have a role to play. But it's not all or nothing as it relates to that. It's not a question of picking one winner and, pick, and choosing another loser. It's all of the above that's going to be uh, able to power us into recovery uh, and where we go. And I can tell you from our standpoint, as a political party, we have got our own task force to work with the government, to challenge the government on, on what this recovery is going to look like. And we're going to provide solutions to the government and challenge them on things that that they, uh, they say they're going to do as well. And so, again, this Team Canada approach is critical. Excellent. I think that's a great segue. Sorry, Mike, I got I to gotta take us to a break. I want, I want you to lead us back in, Mike. I love uh, ending this segment on a Team Canada a sort of uh, attitude. Let's go to break real quick. We've got uh, Member of uh, Federal Parliament, John Broussard, here in Ottawa. He's our Member of uh, Parliament for Barrie and Innisfil. We'll be right back on Hitting Home with Mike and Arf right after this break. Introducing the McLaren 5050, an online raffle in support of the not-for-profit McLaren Arts Centre. This monthly draw is organized with the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, giving you a chance to win big. www.mac5050.com Are you a woman experiencing abuse? Do you know a woman experiencing abuse? Help is available any time of day or night. Sheltersafe.ca is an online map that helps you find a women's shelter or transition house that meets your needs so you can live a life free from violence. Sheltersafe.ca. Help is just a click away. I want you to help me. I'm 
play my game. You don't just give up on the people you love. Game's not over. Buckle up. Ooh. The Matthews House Hospice Bucket List Lottery is now on. The next early bird draw is on May 27th and the grand prize draw on July 1st. Tickets available online at mhh5050.ca and throughout South Simcoe. What's on your bucket list? Welcome back to Hitting Home with Mike and RF. We've got a tight third segment, so let's keep it tight. Mike, what have you got for us? I know you wanted to talk local. Well, on the local level, uh, we know that, uh, and John would know this both as a former uh, Barrie City Councillor and as the sitting uh, MP for Innisfil and Barrie, uh, a lot of people come from the GTA moving into our area because of the affordability and just because it's a great place to live. I think the pressure will be even greater. We'll have people selling their GTA homes and buying homes for half the price up here as a result of the pressures of COVID-19. Plus, new home buyers will have even more pressure to look beyond to buy more affordable housing. Do you see that having an impact in, uh, in your region there, John? Well, first of all, Mike, why wouldn't anyone want to live up here? That would be that would be my, that would be my first question too. Uh, absolutely, and and obviously we've got development plans. Uh, the former uh, annex lands are already we're starting to see development on those lands. I know the town of Venezuel has got a development plan uh, in place as well. So I fully expect that there will be a lot more people moving up from the Greater Toronto area into our area. Rightly so. We've got it all. Um, and affordability is one of the issues that many people will look at. And with that comes some great things, too. I mean, we're seeing, uh, you know, a really diverse community develop. We've got a lot of uh, multicultural groups that are moving up to Barrie Innisville, and uh, it's just amazing to see uh, how diverse our community is becoming. Uh, John, let me ask you this one. Hey, hang on, Mike. I want to follow up on that. John, that's that's great for the folks coming up from the GTA. Obviously, affordability, some space, more house for the dollar, et cetera. But that's going to put pressure on people who are already trying to uh, migrate or move within the existing community as well. It's going to put pressure on, on housing stock of, uh, and availability. Well, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a real estate agent, but I suspect that as the demand increases, so too will the pricing. And so, for those who are here already, like we are, um, you know, we may see an increase in our house prices. But again, if the demand is there, it's there for a reason, not just because. People want to, you know, more house for their money. They want lifestyle. They want recreation. They want culture. They want education. They want uh, Kempenfelt Bay and Lake Simcoe. I mean, we got it all up here. So I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised by that demand, especially since you know our area, our particular area, is a uh, is a uh, regional hub. Yeah, and I might add that that demand also creates incentive for development, which helps to offset that. So I expect that our both our Resale and our new home uh, sectors will probably continue to be busy and uh, going forward. There's something and, else and, 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 and I'll add one. I'll add one more thing to that, Mike. Sorry for interrupting, but you know, if we're talking about if we're talking about you know coming out of this COVID-19 crisis and the impact that it's had on the economy, as I said earlier, typically construction is one of those sectors that we can count on to propel us out of the problems that we're facing right now. So I see it as a win-win. Well, yeah. the construction industry, construction-related industry, including renovation, we're seeing, we're going to see some of the best curb appeal ever in the last several decades because of all the people who are at home, but they're still tapping into the big box stores or the local garden centers and the local home improvement uh, it's a huge part of the construction industry. And I don't know, uh, John, you'd, you'd know better than I do. Is it 20%, 22% of the GDP somewhere in there is construction-related uh, activity? I don't know the exact number, but it's close to that, era. Mike, I'm sorry, for, I'm sorry for cutting you off before, Mike. But Not at all. I, don't know what, uh, yeah. I just, something that's a personal note for me and perhaps for all of us uh, of our uh, age with, with aging parents, and that is uh, the, uh, and it's kind of an overlapping sector, uh, both with, the uh, health care and, and housing, and that is the long-term care sector. And this crisis has certainly put a light on and shown that, the, that there are shortcomings within our long-term care system. Uh, 
Um, is your go uh, government, is opposition, opposition government putting pressures on the federal government to do more to ensure that going forward our, our long-term care sector is, is better run? I mean, my father is in long-term care. Thankfully, he's in one of the better uh, homes, but mm. unfortunately for many families, uh, this has caught them off guard. Uh, yeah, yeah. My, 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 my mother-in-law is at Allendale Station, of course. There was a scare about uh, a positive case in there just two weeks yeah. ago, Mike. So uh, obviously, you know, our family felt anxious at the time, and I'm thankful that um, the case was uh, a false positive. But on the issue of long-term care and seniors' facilities, uh, obviously all of us have a responsibility, whether we're in opposition or government, but, but that falls within provincial jurisdiction. And I was very pleased today to hear that the provincial government uh, is uh, going to have a, a commission uh, looking at long-term care facilities specifically related uh, to the type of health care that goes on in there because there's been over 1,400 people in Ontario uh, senior residences that have been impacted and affected by COVID-19. So uh, that was announced today and uh, I'll be anxious right. to see what the results of, of the study uh, show. Yeah. John, you've got one minute. Issue. Sorry, sorry there, Arf. Well, it is a provincial issue. A lot of the funding does come from the federal level, does it not? Uh, well, the, the health transfers come from the federal level. Yeah. And so but they're, the they're but it's up to the province to uh, regulate uh, long-term care facilities. And so uh, so this commission, uh, I'm sure, will uh, will be an eye-opener for a lot of people. Okay. All right, sorry, John, Arf. I got... Less than a minute. I got to ask you to wrap up with this thought. What can the federal government do to assist homeowners, new homeowners, homeowners uh, access uh, um, uh, programs that are, for example, how will they modify CMHC related programs to get people uh, in a position where they can be in their own home, access uh, affordable housing, access those programs? And uh, lastly, uh, I, I would say to you, uh, oh, shoot, and I just gapped it. I'm sorry, guys, and we're live and we're not cutting. I'll leave that with you. 20 seconds. What, what are you going to do to get, get them to stimulate affordability? I think, I think Arif and Mike knows this, that the Ontario Real Estate Association and the Canadian Real Estate Association are, are best suited to tell government what we need in order to make home ownership more affordable. And I've met many times with Aria and Crea. Uh, you know, some of our policies leading into the last election reflected exactly what we were hearing. And we don't have time to get into them. But if we listen to those who are on the ground, who understand that industry as politicians, then we can make good policy decisions based on what they tell us. That is perfect. Now, We've got to go in five seconds. Everybody, goodbye. Thanks for watching Hitting Home with Mike and Aria.